So first off, I appreciate all you guys being here, you know, or getting up early, coming to a clinic, taking time out of your day on a weekend. I appreciate that. Anytime I get an opportunity to speak, it means the world to me, you know, as a younger strength coach sitting in these chairs, you know, obviously we have strength coaches that have worked more years than I have in this crowd, you know, some young strength coaches coming up. So to be able, anytime you can speak to your peers and people that are passionate about the same thing is an awesome opportunity. Awesome opportunity. And one thing, you know, where also, too, before we get going, last night, if you were here, you know, Drew from University of Colorado did an amazing job. You know, I was sitting in the front row. It was great to be able to sit there and hear what he's doing there. And it's not about what he's doing at Colorado. It's about what he does for those young men. And I say young men only because currently he's working just football like myself. But it's what you do for your athletes that really makes the difference. You know, where a little over a year ago, where uh, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. They weren't sure how bad it was, where um, you know, they weren't sure you know, if it was in the bloodstream going through my whole body. You know, and what I did was I delayed going to the doctor, going to the doctor, going to the doctor. I had a small bump on my neck, didn't think anything of it. You know, my lifting was going good, felt energized, good to go. Ignored it, ignored it, ignored it, until one day that little bump was about the size of a golf ball and is still growing. So I went to the doc, had thyroid cancer, spread out to the neck in two spots, spread into the chest, you know, and then through the surgery process, they were gonna see if it spread anywhere else. So had a 13 hour surgery, almost died on the table. Uh, they had to bring me back to life, so that was an interesting experience. And then also too, you know, where I just went through heavy radiation treatment because of how bad it was. But it's one of those to where in that process, you know, where whether you're a young coach or you're an old coach, the one thing I can tell you that I took away from that process tied to what we do professionally is what you do for your athletes on a day in, day out basis, it matters. It means the world to them, even if at that moment they don't see that. Okay, because where I couldn't tell you how many calls, text messages from athletes all the way back to the start of my career that I worked with at Davidson College, you know, that reached out through that process. So it's one to where on a day in, day out basis, you know, if you're having a hard day and what you do, you know, if it's a frustrating day with the athletes you're working with, frustrating day with a coach you interact with and work with and for, understand at the end of the day, in this profession, we may have all got into it for certain reasons, but at the end of the day, if you're in it and you're truly in it, you're in it to impact the people you work with and for. And that's a very, very big deal. And at the end of the day, too, none of us are perfect. We talk about that all the time in our program. You know, human beings are meant to be imperfect. Doesn't mean we don't strive for perfection, but we're never gonna reach that top of the mountain peak of perfection, it's impossible. And if you think you're perfect, you know, odds are you're not. You know? But it's one of those to where, you know, being that example to the young men and women you work with and work for, it mean, you know, it's gonna impact them at some point, and it's a special thing when it does. So that's a big thing that I, you know, we're even seeing more clearly you know, to where I got into this field because I love lifting weights. For me, it was an escape. Parents got divorced when I was three, you know, and then my uncle, my mom's brother, was really kind of like the male example in my life to where I went to the gym with him all the time. And I saw his crew of guys that he lifted with, you know, and it was just big dudes throwing around heavy weight, you know, going out for pizza afterwards, you know, and even as a, as a kid in preschool, I was like, I'm hooked. Like, lift weights and pizza, I'm in, you know, let me get older and I'll keep doing this, you know, and so unfortunately, you know, I'm taking advantage of the pizza part too. But, where, but it's one of those to where, you know, my passion came from, that was my escape. You know, for me, I was a three sport athlete and I joke around and say I was a three sport athlete because I sucked at all three. You know, I was trying to find what I was good at. But it was one of those to where in the weight room, you know, you always got, in the weight room, you always get what you work for. You know, we tell the guys all the time, the weight room is the perfect example of life because that weight doesn't care what color you are, doesn't care what background you are, it doesn't care if you had a good day or a bad day. It's going to be there and do the same thing time after time after time. And then the way we try to design our program is where, you know, through the recruiting process, you know, we get maybe 30 minutes with these kids when they come on campus. But then when they're on campus, we're with them more than the position coach, head coach, coordinator. And so I always joke around that they only give us 30 minutes on the recruiting trip because, you know, it's going to feel like they're with you 30 years. When, when they're actually with you when they come to the program, if they choose the program that you're with. But it's one of those to where, you know, at first, I don't know all the background pieces that the recruiting coach may know, that the head coach may know. But our first interaction is we sit down with them and tell them what we expect, how we expect them to work, what our program's about. 
and then the way we design our workout, and we'll talk about that a little bit, even though I'm kind of highlighting certain specifics of our program, the way we design it is it's gonna let us know what that kid's about right away. We're gonna know if there's someone that'll push, will they work, you know, are they extroverted, introverted, you know, are they someone that's gonna worry about themselves initially or care about their teammates? Because at the end of the day, the biggest thing that we're trying to instruct and pull out of these guys is really the concept of team. To where, you know, my, the head coach I work for, and I've been with him 12 years now, so as Lon was going through my resume, where, you know, it's wherever he's gone, I've gone. You know, and he's taking great care of me. You know, he's, he's a friend beyond someone that I work with, you know, to someone that I work with, a coach that I work for. But it's one to where, you know, the goal of our program is to make you a better man. And at the end of the day, you know, the part of becoming a better man rests on what we do in that program. And so a lot of times, you know, coaches throw around the word toughness. And, I, you know, I always joke around now. I'm like, coach, what's tough mean? I was like, as coach, you know, where, and I've been with him a long time now where I can say this to him, where a lot of other coaches on our staff are still scared to, like, say stuff to him. But I'll be like, coach, I was like, if I get up and knock you out right now, am I tougher than you? You know, because that's tough, right? Like, we fight and I win. He's like, no. You know, and I was like, okay, well, what's tough then? And so to me, toughness is consistency. It's day in, day out, you're doing the same thing. It's you get up, you give your best, and you go to sleep, and you wake up the next day and you do the same. And if you make a mistake, you learn from your mistake, and you keep chugging along and moving forward. You know? So that's, that's what our program is about, and that's what our program is trying to get out of these kids and turn them from kid to young man to man. I'll tell everyone in our program, you, know, you heard it last night, they'll treat you like men until you act otherwise. So I tell the guys when they come in, I said, I'm gonna, based on how you handle yourself, I'm going to put you in the category of kid, which means that you're immature, you don't handle your business, and you can't be relied upon. Young man, meaning that, you know what, you still may make more mistakes than you want to, but as a young man, you learn from the mistakes, you recognize the mistakes, and you work hard to improve upon them, and you're becoming more and more trustworthy. And then a man is a guy that just handles his business. And obviously, you can use the same analogy, you know, for a woman, it's the same thing. It's no different, you know, and that's what we're trying to do is make these kids into young men to men so they can understand and handle their business. Key points of our overall program, you know, were, so here, you know, before we kind of tie into some of the other things we do, strength is the foundation of what we're doing. Strength is the house that we're building upon for these guys. So to kind of go off a of reference that we heard last night as well, if you're building a house, that foundation needs to be solid because if the foundation is weak, it doesn't matter what you put on top of that thing, it's gonna crack and fall apart. And so for us, where in everything that we do, you know, where to me, you know, where you have two speakers in a row now, I guess, to where I'm not a huge functional movement screen guy. Because to me, everything we do, from your warm up to your lifting to any cool down activities you might do, that's your movement screen. And if you're watching it, and you're attentive to what's going on as a coach and your coaching staff is the same, or you position yourself and set yourself up to see what's going on, you have a everyday movement screen taking place where you can judge improvement, see improvement, and watch what's taking place. And a good friend of mine, J.L. Holdsworth, you know, he makes the comment to where he's like, strength can fix a lot of issues. You know, and I firmly believe that you know, strength can fix a lot of issues that you have going on. Variety and variation in our program is, is key. You know, at the end of the day, an analogy I tell all recruits when they come in, and I want to make sure that, you know, it holds true when you get to our program, to where you can walk in this room we're in right now, some of the lights are on, some are off, but you can walk in and flick one or two switches, and all the lights go on. Okay, if those lights are your muscles, it doesn't work that way. Just because you're squatting doesn't mean every area of your glute, your hamstring, your quad is turned on. You know, that's why, you know, you utilize different lifting bars, utilize different stances, utilize different accessory work. That's why all of us have weak points and strong points because everything doesn't just turn on and light up when you're training. So we want to do a wide variety of things to be able to make sure over the course of the training week, weeks, months, years that we get, if we're fortunate to get multiple, you know, as I said, more than three years with them, to where we want to make sure that everything's turned on over the course of that training week and cycle. We're a conjugate-based program. So where, when I, I went to grad school, did my GA at Kentucky. So when I went to Kentucky, it was the best decision I ever made in my life. I had no idea 
how great of a decision that was going to be. And the reason it was such a great decision is because I worked for an open-minded coach in Mark Hill, who's now an associate AD there, that allowed you to explore the knowledge you were trying to, to learn. You know, where when he trusted you and I got to the point where I had my own groups and stuff like that to where he would sit there and say, hey, if you want to implement what you want to implement here for shoulders, go ahead and feel free or do this or do that. You know, you built trust and he trusted you to carry out your job. You know, but then also while I was there, I mentioned J.L. Holdsworth, uh, Kevin DeWeese was another uh, undergraduate kind of paid intern spot. But we're very fortunate to where as I was coming in, a guy that was coming out that was still in the area was Jim Windler. So if you ever heard of 531, that's Jim's program there. And I was very fortunate to where I did some powerlifting meets in college. Obviously, I love training. We already talked about that. But it was one to where they invited me to come join their gym to train with them in a one-car garage. And then from there, as Jim moved up to Columbus and started working full-time for Elite FTS, our gym shifted to a different place as kind of some of the members of the gym moved around the state. But that was a great experience. And what it did was it opened my eyes, and every time someone hears conjugate, as Lon talked about, you know, he wants to bring in people with different opinions and views to these clinics, to where what it did was it opened my eyes to the West Side system. Because as an undergraduate, all I knew was the NSCA, and the NSCA puts out phenomenal information. We're obviously sitting and standing in their house right now. But I knew that, and I knew muscle and fitness. Okay, I went to a Division III school, Frostburg State University in Western Maryland. We had no strength coach for our sports teams there. It was you had a position coach giving you stuff to do, and that was that. So to me, when I got, exposed, when I got to Kentucky and got exposed to something different that I wasn't exposed to, to where it blew my mind. And so at first, you know, because I loved lifting heavy. I loved it more than anything else. It made you feel good walking out of the gym, you know, where, and you could see progress through their system. And then so at some point when I was training, you know, you're reading articles on Elite FTS, you know, you're reading Louie's articles on his website. And I remember one weekend, because Friday was always our dynamic squat day in the garage, this one guy that was writing articles for Elite FTS as well, because at the time, Dave Tate was just taking articles from whoever would come to where this one guy, I can't remember his name, but I remember what happened. He came down. He had several articles on the website. It was our dynamic squat day. We're getting ready to lift. The bar's on the rack. There's no weight on the bar. But, you know, he wants Jim to analyze him, you know, in his squat suit. So he walks over to the bar, hooks a strap of his suit on the bar, and starts hanging down to try to get his suit to ride up his legs. If you ever put on a squat suit, you know it takes some time. And the bar goes flying, he falls down, and all of us are like, what the hell just happened? And then what made it even worse after that is he put the bar back up and did the same thing two more times. So it was one of those to where I remember after that, I went home that night, and I'm talking to my now wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. She was back in the state of Maryland, where we're from, going to grad school at Maryland. And I remember saying, you know what? I got to dive deeper into this beyond articles on Elite FTS and uh, articles that just Louie writes, even though Louie's a genius. I got to find out where this system came from. Because you know what? As I learned today, honey, some of the guys writing these articles aren't very bright. And so... And so <laughs> So it's one of those to where I sat there and then I dove into, okay, where did Louie design his system? Because at the end of the day, it was designed for the sport of powerlifting. And then he believes, and it can, carry out to athletes across the board. But over the years and over time, what you learn is you don't learn training philosophies. You learn training principles. You ingrain yourself in the science of developing an athlete and developing yourself. And so at the end of the day, when I was a younger strength coach, and there was still hair in this portion of my head, and I was a little thinner, and some of my chest hairs weren't gray, I would sit in these seats, and I would argue what I believe to the death. Argue it to the death. You know, I'm right, you're wrong. You know, and a great quote one of my assistants said one time was, as strength coaches, we agree on 90% of the same thing, but it's that 10% we'll fight to the death over in our differences. And what I learned over time is where, where the difference lies isn't necessarily, because you don't really get people arguing over periodization schemes. You know, you don't get people arguing over, oh, you squat on Friday, not Tuesday? What are you thinking? You know, you get people arguing over exercises, training means. And at the end of the day, if you believe in training principles, those pillars that can't be knocked down, okay, it takes effort to get those pillars to crack, the whole world is your oyster in this field. 
Because then at that point, it says, what exercise is the right exercise to plug in for the situation I'm in, the group of athletes I'm working with, and to the, you know, the intangibles you're trying to develop? That is huge. You know, if you understand the body and how the body works, you know, to argue over exercises, to me, as it was said last night, you're majoring in the minors. You know, because every exercise can develop an athlete. When you look at an athlete, so right now I currently develop athletes for the sport of football. And we'll utilize components of the weightlifting world, the powerlifting world, the bodybuilding world. Because I superset and giant set things or circuit things at times, people tell me I utilize the CrossFit world. So, okay, if that's what they want to say, great. And then we'll do strongman type activities, so we'll utilize the strongman world as well. And then we sit there and we'll condition them based off the demands of the primary energy systems and the order of those systems in their training. And then bam, that's our program. And so it doesn't matter what exercise you plug in, you're plugging in exercises to fit the needs of the groups that you have. I'll ask you, once they bring this back up, we will keep going from there. So there must be an issue with my presentation, as my wife will tell you, I'm always difficult. So I'm bringing my difficultness right here to the NSCA. But where, so now, when I back to the conjugate program, to where my definition, my simplistic definition of conjugate is just, you know what, the max effort method, the dynamic effort method, and the repetition method. And I also kind of categorize another one in working with athletes, that's the sub-max effort method, because we may not take everything to a true max every time. All four of those are always present in varying percentages. And bam, that's how very simplistically I define what we do. And then we train the energy systems, we work mobility, and your program as a whole is your prehab. Training is preventative as a whole. Over the course of the training week, like we already talked about, make sure everything's activated. You know, everything we do is an evaluation or a screen like we talked about from our warm up to our lift to when we implement certain cool down type activities. You know, and then we want to make sure that things are simple versus complex. In our program, you want to talk about simple, I think we're, we're very simple. You know, but we want to make things simple for the athlete because once again, too, when, we, when they come in the weight room, we want to make that not easy in the sense of how they train, but we want to make it easy to carry out what they're doing. And once again, too, that's nothing against what anyone else does. Okay? You do you. Okay, and we'll do us. But at the end of the day, okay, we want to make things as simple as possible versus some of the complexities that can take place in training. Because training as a whole is general to general specific. The specific task is what you're doing. All right? If you're a power lifter, the specific is the squat, the bench, and the deadlift when you're on the platform. If you're a football player, the specific is playing the game of football for the position you play. And then everything we do is general or general specific in nature. So general just means none of the qualities, the way you show them on the court or field, are taking place the same way during that exercise. So if I'm sitting there saying, well, I squat, and I'm using my legs and my core, and I use my legs and my core on the field or the court, that's specific. No, you're wrong. Because it's not being used the same way. It's not being activated in the same manner as it does in your sport. General specific just means one or more of those qualities are taking place during the activity that you're doing. And where we really push the general specific is more in our conditioning as we build closer to the season. Okay, general layouts of our off season, four days a week we're lifting. We have two primary upper body days, two primary lower body days. You know, and then over the course of those days, and I'll show you our winter off season in a little bit, over the course of those days, we got the max effort method, the submax effort, dynamic and repetition taking place in a variety of ways. We do three days a week of conditioning in the winter and spring off season. We have one speed day, one agility day, and one work capacity day. And that's how we break it down for what we did this winter with the guys and what we'll do this spring. And then in the summer, we go four days a week of conditioning. We go a speed and agility day where stuff's combined. We have two football specific and tempo work days. So what we do is we bring the guys in we warm them up as part of our accountable hours. Then they have voluntary, optional football work. And then we bookend that with a tempo run at the end 
to make sure no one decides to walk off during that voluntary optional work is what we got going there. And then, and then we have one day where we work on their metabolic conditioning, simulating what your average play times are to you know, the high end of the anaerobic, you know, anaerobic non-lactic system to the low end. So we're doing drills that may take two point something seconds to like 12 or 13 seconds in time. Then we give them anywhere from 15 to 40 seconds rest to simulate what they're gonna go through at practice and on game day in certain, certain scenarios. Okay, so now moving into like how we talked about our program simplistic. So our goal is of power development. So we want to make sure we're activating the fast twitch muscle fiber through high rates of force development, the speed of the movement. Okay, so like where depending on how you classify max effort or dynamic, so dynamic just means bam, things are moving fast. It's power output. And then in max effort, the way you describe max effort is things are over 90% of your lifting potential. So, and both of those methods bring out fast twitch fiber activation. Okay, triple extension of the hip, knee, and ankle, either in the vertical or horizontal plane. And when I say some exceptions to this, because some of our exercises that get hip and knee extension, we'll keep our feet on the ground like a band pull through or a kettlebell swing. But for us, you know, where there's a lot of ways to get triple extension. And once again, too, as coaches working with athletes to where their primary goal is the sport that they play or sports that they play, where, you know, how I look at it, and I say this all the time, is where I'm not going to wholeheartedly invest. If I have a football player, all right, the world's my oyster to train them. But sometimes, too, I think we can get too invested into certain styles of weight sports to where I'm not going to sit there and tell that football player, if I'm at a school like when I was at Davidson, the football players went home for the summer. So I'm not going to sit there and tell that football player, hey, this summer, here's your agility packet. And when the player looks at it and he says, coach, for my agility packet and my speed packet, you just have me playing tennis every day. Yep, that's right, you know, because I'm going to take one sport and use that sport to train another sport. So, yep, go play tennis every day. So for our, our profession, we are really the lucky ones because we can pull from everything and pull from it and apply it how we want to apply it, that you feel comfortable applying it, and implement it onto the athletes we're fortunate to be around. So we'll, when we switch to the next slide, we'll get those extensions in a wide variety of ways. Explosive movement variety is big for us. You know, we have progressions in the vertical plane, the horizontal plane. You know, we have combo progressions where it may be a horizontal jump to a vertical jump or a vertical jump to a horizontal jump. And then any exercise can become a dynamic exercise. And obviously, you know, if we want to be sticklers about it, or you can sit there and be like, so coach, you do dynamic curls? Just have them grab like a five pound plate and get after it. Maybe, no, just kidding, that's nowhere. But, but essentially, any exercise can be turned into a dynamic movement based on the weight percent of maximum that you're using. And these exercises are high stress movements on the CNS due to the speed of the movement. A lot of times we'll use Pearl Open Chart to dictate the volume when we're in the weight room doing our plyometric work, and we kind of look at the 80% or above. Charlie Francis, who is really kind of the godfather of the high-low sequencing, you know, where he kind of says if you're 80% or above, he puts it to high because of the way it affects the glycolytic system. So we do the same thing. So we kind of keep our plyometric volume of in-house weight room stuff to 20 reps or less for what we got going that day. That doesn't mean we don't jump rope. I don't count those like low-level contacts or stuff like that. But for high, like you're going to push hard through the floor and you're going to generate a ton of force, we use Pearl Open Chart to kind of dictate our volume. And you see some other kind of notes up there as it relates to some of the sections of Pearl Open. Samples of our power exercises. So I apologize for not having videos of our guys going through this or our staff going through it, but where you know, all of us can visualize to extent what it is. So I don't have every exercise listed because once again, the world's your oyster. If you have the access and you're progressing your athletes, you know, then you can visually progress and think of what you can do in these areas. But in the vertical plane, body weight, vertical jumps, and a big thing, like a lot of times I feel like when you get, when we find, when we get athletes in our program, a big thing I noticed is that they struggle to do this. Like when they jump, if you say, hey, jump, They'll jump hard, but they do this. Well, they don't even throw their arms, so let me, I'll put this down, but they'll do this. They don't bring their hips through. They don't bring their hips through. I don't know what they're saving it for, but they don't bring it through. So to me, 
We struggle, one, that's a sign is the next phase of this talk, posterior chain development, because what brings those hips through or aids them is the glutes. But they struggle to bring their hips through. So for me, I want them to be able to jump, you know, and be able to sit there and get full extension, push hard through the ground. You know, that was quick. Unfortunately, I don't get up very high. But, we're, uh, but we want them to be able to generate that hip drive and utilize the glutes and push hard through the ground to generate and receive force. So various body weight vertical jumps, hurdle hops to vertical jumps. We'll use the hurdle hop to start introducing kind of like a quick receive force and working on the stretch reflex to react and get up. Resisted vertical jumps, just like over time you progress your weight on a squat or a bench or a clean, it's the same thing here. You can add resistance in appropriate ways to sit there and increase resistance on the vertical jump to spark the training effect that you want. Various style box jumps, single leg variation jumps, weighted to body weight jumps where they may be holding dumbbells for two vertical jumps, release them and get a body weight vertical jump, throw in the arms, medicine ball throws where your feet leave the ground, depth jumps, and that's a progress down the road for our guys. One arm dumbbell snatches, I like that for shoulder stability and also working on getting the hips through and various barbell or dumbbell pulling exercises, you know, so hang clean, hang, you know, hang snatched, pulls, not the full lift, you know, we'll utilize those as well with bars and dumbbells. The horizontal plane, you know, a lot of it covers the same stuff, just at a different angle. Body weight again, hurdle hop to broad jump, teaching them to utilize that stretch reflex. Broad jump to a box landing, you know, so we may have, like we've had guys where, so for box jumps, we've had guys get up to 60 inches on the box, where for the, the broad jump, box jump, we have them broad jump to a box, a 12 inch box, and we've had guys that can do that and land on the box anywhere from nine to 10 feet back is our progression there. They can do that for our skill guys. Resisted broad jumps, single leg variations, med ball throws again, but in the horizontal plane, depth to broad jump, kettlebell swings, you know, bam, depending on how you utilize this motion of the swing, bam pull throughs and tire flips, we kind of put in the horizontal plane category. Combo jump, so anything you can imagine where you go vertical to broad, like horizontal or horizontal to vertical will work for you there. Dynamic weight room movements, once again, anything can become a dynamic movement. So squat, box squat, bench, deadlift will be the main ones we use there. Other power producing exercises, a lot of times I think people forget that, you know what, sprinting is a dynamic movement. You know, sprinting puts a minimum if not more, three times force of your body weight into the ground. You know, there's not a lot of us that can clean three times our body weight, squat three times our body weight, maybe deadlift three times our body weight. But you know what, like you put a lot of force through one leg every time you sprint if you're running hard. And so that counts as the dynamic exercise for us. Our change of direction drills, sled pushes, different with lighter weights, upper body medicine ball throw exercises for upper body plyos or plyo push-ups. You know, there's you know, the, once again, the world's your oyster here. Moving into the posterior chain development, you know, so when we talk posterior chain, we're talking the back of the neck all the way through your calves into your feet. You know, to us, those are the postural muscles. You know, as it was touched upon last night, you know, a lot of times you get athletes walking through your door, you know, and they're rounded forward, you know, where, you know, they love the anterior chain work, you know, but they can't sit there and utilize the posterior chain. And there was a great analogy last night, you know, to where essentially, you know, I mean, you're laying down on that bench, you know, with a bunch of sand on your backside, you know, or you're taking that bar out of the squat rack, you know, without something that can sit there and be very stabilized supporting for you. So for us, the posterior chain, you know, we take pictures of our guys. Coach Anderson wants us to take kind of before and after pictures when they come in as a freshman and progress it through their career. And we don't, we take them at rest. We don't take them like, okay, they just had a good upper body pump, so let's take the picture. We take them at rest so we can see postural changes. We can see the this to this. And we can see like that hamstring filling out, you know, and taking up, you know, you know the hamstrings learning to meet more of the glute because they're developing there when we take those pictures and those are the things kind of we're looking for. But to us, you know, the posterior chains, everything from the back of the neck down into the feet from the calves. We want to stress these muscles with a variety of movements. Once again, too, the light, the light bulb analogy. We want to stress them with a variety of movements. 
You know, and we train them at a minimum of a two to one ratio, and it's really more than that to the anterior side. Because it's one of those to where, you know, we have, I know last night we had a, a demoer that is coming back from a torn ACL to where one of the things they look for, you know, when you look at, okay, posterior strength to anterior strength, does the posterior side have to be equal to the anterior side to get cleared? You can answer that out loud. Does anyone know? What, say it again. 80%. Okay, so you're telling me like you're okay with the back side just being 80% on the front side? So it's one to where we're going to hammer that back side hard to try to sit there and do everything we can to develop that area for the athletes to hopefully develop them better for their sport and the stressors that come with their sport. Okay. Samples of posterior chain exercises, once again, is this every exercise out there? Absolutely not, but samples of stuff we do neck heart for the neck, harness extensions, machine extensions, plate extensions, you know, ISO neck band holds, you know, ISO neck stability ball holds. We'll do partner resisted and or partner ISO hold stuff too. For the upper back traps rear adult shoulder complex, we'll actually, to finish up the presentation, we'll go out here and go over some of the shoulder series stuff that we do with the guys to get different ranges of motion and strength in. You know, so where I would love to have a couple volunteers from the crowd and we can put you through what we do shoulder stuff with the guys. But you see there's a wide variety of things there. Face pulls, various IYTLWA, like arm hold movements, pull apart, scap push up, hand walks, black burns. You know, also we refer to our black burn as like a Y to hand behind the back retraction push up plus, so where your shoulder blades are contracted, down, up, and then release them. Band shakers is as we take different tubing, put them around our wrist, and as we shake our arms to turn on the muscles and go through various ranges of motion. Various external, internal rotational movements, ex like where um, the next one, external rotate, punch Y or T reverse. I'll show you when we go on the floor in a few minutes. Retract to various letters, you know, so like where retract the shoulder blades, hold small plates, retract to V, Retract to I, you can do different things there. Standing or on the ground or seated. Retract, row, flip, Y press is a band movement we do, or, or also a plate movement. The row, flip, Y press is a band one. Shoulder taps, and then shrug variations. So, and then at the end of my presentation too, I have my email. So if you, if you want this presentation or, you know, where I'll give you, if you want it during the day while we're out there, if you want my cell number, I'll give it to you. And if you need me to take little mini videos of some of these things, I'll, I'll send you whatever you need. So at the end of the day, if there's a way I can help you, I will help you any way I can. And then, you know, upper, mid back, chin ups, pull ups, row variations. For the low back, reverse hypers. Back extensions, 45 degree back extensions, good morning variations, bam pull throughs, QL walks. So where Donnie Thompson, who probably one of our speakers later today will make reference to, you know, first got a total 3,000 in the world of powerlifting. You know, Donnie has great information out there, as do other people that have great valid information. But we were getting a lot of low back pain in our guys. And when we purchased and were able to bring in the true reverse hyper machine, combined with these QL walks, our back pain went away. So it's one of those, we haven't had any back, you know, knock on wood, we haven't had any back issues since, but once again, too, you revert to people that are strong and lift heavy things and move heavy things, and they know how to sit there and address those issues, those QL walks, and obviously I'm a big believer in the reverse hypers anyway, but we didn't have those machines at the time, so I did what we had to do to purchase them, and it worked out great. For the glutes, you know, glute hamstring bridges, a lot of various things there. Glute hamstring raises, the glute ham raise machine, you know, where a lot of these crossover categories, you know, but where we'll do a lot of glute bridging in our warm up or what we call performance prep to try to get the guys to lock in a little more. But we'll do a ton of glute bridge stuff during that time to get things turned on and firing for the work that's ahead. And then, and then we got, you know, for the hamstrings, glute ham raises, again, RDLs, eccentric leg curls, band leg curls, hamstring slides. So taking like the slider boards, or we take like the little kind of like booties you'd put over your feet for a slide board. And then, you know, on the ground, we glute ham bridge up and eccentrically lower out for the hamstring slides. And then for the calves, a ton of single leg, double leg stuff, you know, and then not just the calves, but also the soleus underneath the gastroc muscle. So here now, hopefully you can see this. Feel free to move up if you want. And once again, like I said too, I'll email this to you. Anything you need or want from, from our program, we'll, we'll send it to you if you contact me at the end. 
Where, but so this now is how it falls in and lays into our program. So this is what we did this past winter. It was a six week cycle that we had before we went into spring ball. So Monday was our auxiliary lower body day. And so on that day, we started off with a duffalo bar squat or a, you know, so a curved bar squat. The company we purchased that one from, the guy's name ties into the name. So some people see it as a buffalo bar, but for that company, it's a duffalo bar. We just did six sets of three, you know, essentially you know, auto-regulated overload. You know, so where whatever they could do that day is what we did, but the goal was to look good while they did it, not fail, and make sure they're getting what we view as a full range of motion, which is parallel and back up. And then they paired that up with a trap bar vertical jump. So there's our resisted vertical jump for six sets of three, reacting one jump to the next. Depth jump to a box jump. So for our veteran guys, they went off of a 12 inch box and then jumped up onto a box jump. For our younger guys or guys that we feel are still a little instable, just because it's on the sheet doesn't mean it's the word that has to apply. When we modify our sheets, our basis, and we go from there. So they did traditional box jumps. Weeks four through five, it switched to a transformer bar squat or a safety squat bar squat. And then barbell squat jumps, regular box jumps. And then week six was our heavy box squat week. We do a, as they would say, like a west side style or a paused parallel box squat as our main squat movement. And then we free squat, front squat, do other things as our auxiliary squatting. And then we had that for week six because we went into our first spring ball practice on that weekend. And then so we, we took it further away from the first practice and that was paired with barbell squat jumps. For our posterior chain work and a lot of our accessory work, what I started doing since we got to Oregon State is where, so if you read a lot of stuff to where like, uh, you know, where Stuart, Dr. Stuart McGill talks about really kind of overloading your core with volume, overloading your posterior chain with volume, and so where, you know, it kind of got me out of the thought process of like, well, you don't always have to do two, three sets of 10 or four sets of 10 of one exercise. You can get your volume accumulated through a variety of exercises. So those glute hand bridges we do in our warm-ups combined with, so like now we went into station accessory work just based on the number of machine equipment that we had. So we went two sets of glute ham raises over the course of the cycle, we added weight, two sets of reverse hypers, added weight over that phase, and then two sets of band resisted 45 degree back extensions and added more band resistance over time. So right there you're getting six sets, but you're getting exposure, turning on more light bulbs, more muscle with three different movements we had a quad hip accessory station where it went backwards sled dragging and then we also did a, so you kind of get like that TKE motion, you know, with the backwards heavy sled drags and then we did a, a stretch for our hips in there and then we had a stabilization based ab station, three exercises, giant set it three times through. Our Tuesday, we did our, our max effort or sub max effort bench work. We're not reading through the whole thing here just because where it's not part of the program, you could say, or part of the presentation, but where what we do when we start our bench training, and what, that's what we'll demo out here, is we take four different movements that we feel hit the shoulder and the shoulder complex, and we build those in two rounds as part of our extended performance prep after we get through our activation and mobility work on the front end. So is there, so it says like build up to 80% of your max week one or week two when we actually had a percentage based training week where it was you're building up to 70% for that first set of nine where they're in the warm up set. So like bar for 10 and then you know 135 for five, they're getting this shoulder stuff done. And so we got, and once again, tied to the posterior chain. So face pulls two by 20, TRX straps, I's and L's, two by 10 each, and then external rotate, punch T reverse, which you'll see out there, two by 20 each arm, and then plate V retract shrug. You know, so they would do those four things, two sets through, to really get those muscles turned on, activated, but also get the stabilization component from it as well. And then weeks four through six, those exercises changed to a dumbbell retract, flip to 90, press up, TRX strap, Y and W, so switching the letters. External rotate, punch Y, reverse, so same exercise, but switching the letter. Push up position, shoulder taps, where you're just staying stable, touching your shoulders, going there. So all that, even though we feel that ties to our posterior chain development. For the back, it was kind of coach's choice, pull up, chin up variations and progressions, and then traps tie into that as well with the trap, try, by giant set. Then Thursday, we got our posterior chain work with the box squat tied into a main movement. 
And then from there, we got our plyometric work in there, so our power development. So the power development there is a single leg broad jump to a double leg landing. And then we have three, a zigzag cone hurdle hop into a broad jump for distance is our power movement there. And then you see more posterior chain stuff, eccentric leg curls, band assisted if needed, band leg curls, the QL walks are in there. You know, and then obviously you still get some posterior chain activation with the quad hip station there, but you see some calf work built in there as well. And once again, some volume based stuff for our abs or core, depending on what term you like to use. And then Friday was our secondary upper body day. You know, so we had a progression with the, the duffalo bar for bench, more volume based. And then, uh, and then from there, our shoulder stuff, we had band up and overs, or what some people call shoulder dislocations for mobility. We had our Y, the hand behind the back retractions, or what some people may refer to as black burns. And then from there, you move into a ton of band pull apart work row variation stuff for your back, shrug variation stuff for the traps, and then we have our neck work in there as well, coach's choice that day, and you're getting all that posterior stuff in. And then this is kind of just a layout of our conditioning. So on Mondays, we did our linear speed work. So we would have different stations. What we did, so this winter, we did what we call a Beaver All-American Challenge. And so what we wanted to do was get maximal effort out of the guys to sit there and you know, hopefully reap the reward of maximal muscle activation from sprinting and running. So we did four different stations, linear based in speed that progressed over time, and we would match up guys together and essentially every station was scored and what is gonna continue into the next phase of our training when we start back up Monday, April 3rd. And at the end, we'll give out first team All-American prizes, second team All-American prizes, and honorable mention All-American prizes to the guys. But it's a way to sit there and make sure that they're ensuring maximal effort and what we want them to do, that it's competitive. You know, we encourage our guys to talk trash and make a stressful situation out of it to get the most out of the guys. And that worked really well with Monday being our linear day. And then Thursday was our change of direction day, same format. Tuesday was our tempo work day, and then we built in some football specific stuff on Saturdays as we led into spring ball. So like I said, we'll move out to the floor. You're not done with me yet, unfortunately, but where here's my email, Evan, E-V-A-N dot Simon, S-I-M-O-N at OregonState.edu. Like I said, if you're around today and you want my cell number, I'll gladly give that out. You know, if you ever want to come visit Oregon State, you're more than welcome to come up and visit us. You know, we're having actually a uh, RPR, so Reflexive Performance Reset Clinic, April 22nd and 23rd, where if you've heard of that, kind of a muscle activation clinic and seminar. If you go on, if you type in Reflexive Performance Reset to the search engine of your choice, you will find their website, and you are more than welcome to join us for that if you want. Where, uh, but. Other than that, we will move out to the floor. I would love to have two demo uh, contributors to show our shoulder stuff, and then we will move on with the rest of the day.